Let me begin by saying that I've worked on this review for seven full days. I played Nier Automata over two days and I've devoted the other five to preparing this video. I literally didn't upload a single video to my channel this week so that I could work on this review where I typically upload about five times per week. And I put in that amount of work for two reasons. Firstly, if you're anything like me, you're not going to play Nier Automata. You look at the cover image and it looks like some weird Japanese hack and slash starring some kinky French made dominatrix and you say, no thanks. You see the bullet hell sequences and it's weird 8-bit stuff and you think, gimmick, I'm good. I get it, that was me seven days ago. But the reason I'm making this video is because Nier is so unbelievably worth playing that if I can convince a single person to play this game after this review, it will have been seven days well spent. The second reason I'm making this review is a little more personal. I'll admit that for the past seven days, I felt like a bit of a crazy person and have seriously questioned my own judgment as someone who appreciates video games. I've scoured the internet for a single reputable review that I feel acknowledges and expresses how much of an unmitigated achievement Nier Automata is, but I'm yet to find one. If you scan Metacritic, you'll find that most of the more respected publications are scoring the game at around 90%, which is obviously an excellent score. But if you actually read or watch their reviews as I have, you'll sense a disconnect between what they are writing, which is typically gushing praise, and how they finally score the game. For me, the scores do not match what they are writing or saying, because these reviewers are describing a 10 out of 10 experience, and yet putting a 9 out of 10 at the end of it. The closest I got to a review that did this game justice was Jim Sterling's, but this is also the perfect example of the phenomena I'm describing. Jim declared Nier one of the most important games ever to be released, and so eloquently dropped the mic at the end of his review by saying, if history forgets this game, then fuck history. He then went on to score the game 9 out of 10. None of this makes any sense to me at all. If these publications are holding back, I can only guess why, because they certainly aren't explaining it in their reviews. Perhaps I'm crazy and Nier is just a really great game, like a whole bunch of other really great games out at the moment. Or perhaps I'm not crazy, and Nier is the caliber of masterpiece that's true value can only be discerned many years after it arrives, and after its impact has had the chance to permeate other experiences that follow it. For now, I'm gonna bet the house on this latter statement. I'll proudly stake what little credibility I might have on the assertion that I think the entire gaming industry, while celebrating Nier Automata, is drastically understating how incredible and important it is. Nier Automata is a rare breakthrough moment in the history of our medium, and it's for this reason that I've poured so much love and care into this review. I want there to be at least one review out there that calls this game for what it is a masterpiece that is an absolute must play for anyone who appreciates video games or good storytelling or incredible music or true innovation in any of the elements I have just listed. Ladies and gentlemen, I humbly submit to you my review of Nier Automata. If you ever watch a street performer, you'll notice something very important about the way they structure and deliver their performances. More than any other type of performance, they constantly seek to exceed and reset your expectations, such that in the very limited time that they perform for you, which is typically only two to five minutes, they deliver something that is not only above what you expected, but beyond what you could have imagined when you first passed this person on the street. In regular intervals, the performance is ratcheted up to continue to delight the crowd. It's all about the performer using every second available to them and to make each one of them count such that the audience is so impressed and so overwhelmed with the scale of the achievement that they feel practically forced to drop dollars into the hat because they got well and truly more value than they could have anticipated when they first took the risk to stop in the middle of the street and watch some random stranger perform for them. I bring up this example because as I played through Nier Automata, achieving all five of its truly worthwhile endings, 
I couldn't help but feel that the people who made it would have also made really great street performers. Because every second of Nier Automata has at its core an urgency to delight and surprise, to challenge expectations and reset them just when the player thinks they've found their measure. Where other games are willing to drop a great moment or surprise and then rest on the laurels of that moment for hours, Nier is ferociously seeking to deliver you the next great moment as quickly as possible, with an equally ferocious desire to ensure that the new moment is both different and better than the previous one. Some days later, I watched an interview with the game's visionary, Yoko Taro, who said this. いろんなチャレンジをしているんですけれども、最終的にやはり同じ人間が考えているものですね。どこか似てしまうというところがあると思うんですね。こう自分自身が今まで作ってきたものに共通点があるとしたら、それは個人的にはちょっと失敗がある
but I suppose I could say that about a lot of narrative-driven games. Not since Metal Gear Solid 1 have I had my video game narrative expectations so drastically reset in such a short time. And the story does not relent for 35 hours. When you think you've finished Nier Automata, you absolutely have not, not even close. After your first 15 hour playthrough, you'll unlock a new game plus, which allows you to replay a large portion of your first playthrough, but from the perspective of another character. There are many out there who feel like the second playthrough of the game is a little too like the first, and I certainly agree with them. While the new perspective provided by the New Game Plus mode provides incredible perspective shifting moments, they do come somewhat infrequently when compared to the pace that we might like. In my view, it would have been better to deliver these moments through some other more condensed means. Be that as it may, I wonder if there wasn't some method in Platinum Games' madness here. I remember reading an interview with the creator of Metal Gear Solid, Hideo Kojima, about his infamous decision to make us play Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 2, and his response always stayed with me. He said, and I'm definitely paraphrasing here, the only way that I could continue to develop Snake as a character was to allow you to view him from the outside. The player themselves cannot be the myth or the legend. For true mythology to exist, it has to be something outside of ourselves. Something we cannot be or even touch. The second playthrough of Nia, allowing you to play through the perspective of 9S, delivers on this idea. By being able to observe the heroine 2B from outside herself, you gain a new appreciation for her strength and motivations as a character, while new plot details are slowly drip-fed throughout the course of your second adventure. It's an exercise in repetition with the intent of evoking attachment, familiarity, and at times awe as you see 2B fight alongside you and for you. It's a narrative device that I think will find as many admirers as detractors, but I applaud it for the courage of its intent, and because enough effort was put in to make sure the experience was meaningfully different from the first playthrough. Whatever your view of the second playthrough, the third will again thrill you, and the three additional endings that branch from this are the real endings of the game. The third playthrough is a totally different story from the first, using only the game world as the constant. Everything else has changed, and the result is that your first two playthroughs begin to feel more like a prologue to these final acts. I cannot speak more of it without spoiling details, but suffice it to say this is not a 15 hour game, it is a 35 or 40 hour game, and the game uses every single hour of that to deliver an ever evolving, deepening and gripping story from start to finish. As I reflect back on the epic that is Nier Automata's story, I'm reminded of the feelings it evoked in me more than the specific plot points points, a genuine connection to the characters, a desperation to learn what's coming next, a willing suspension of disbelief, and a constant thought process of decoding clues and hints and minor character tells to deduce their meaning in the context of the broader story. Like any great thriller or suspense, Nia knows how to engage the emotional and logical parts of your brain in equal measure, and the convincing characterizations will win over all but the most cynical viewers. You don't need to be a fan of Japanese anime or sci-fi to appreciate Nia's narrative. It stands on its own two feet the way that any great story does. The game world in which Nier Automata is set is either by design or by accident a masterstroke of level design. Anyone who has played Dark Souls will know the compact and interconnected design of the original game, with the Firelink Shrine serving as your literal hearth and the rest of the game branching around it. But Nier takes this idea further by compacting the world even further and choosing to use it as more of a theatre stage than a traditional video game environment. To return to the Dark Souls example, the Dark Souls world may be interconnected, but you visit each area only once to progress through the game, and subsequent visits are typically only to use the space as a thoroughfare access to get to a new area. Nia sets up a number of key landmark areas, and then reuses these spaces to tell different stories. In one large square just outside of the Resistance camp, which is sort of the base, I fought a giant oil rig mech, and I chatted with the wreckage of another one, and I flew through there in a bullet hell sequence, and I fought to protect my squad mate from a group of androids all gone haywire. This was literally all in the one game space that I kept revisiting again and again over the 35 hours. And while some may call this laziness on the part of the developer, I call it genius. 
I developed a level of familiarity with the space that I achieve in so few games. Because the truth is we rarely grow connected to the environments we play in or come to truly know them. That is, in single player, story driven games at least. But here, I came to know the world intimately and every return to a landmark reminded me of the two or three or five incredible story combat moments I've had there before and how far I'd come since that time. We fondly remember the Firelink Shrine in Dark Souls because it felt like home and it held memories for us. Here in Nia, almost every part of the map becomes its own Firelink Shrine, a place brimming with familiar memories. As we move either to or through each of these areas, we're not loathing the backtracking, but we're nostalgic. It's a strange sensation to be feeling when an experience is still so fresh in your mind. And all the while, you find yourself captivated by the beauty of the world. The drab, decaying city ruins tells the story of a lost civilization. The Forest Kingdom invokes genuine awe as we gaze up at the towering castle. I'll never forget the first moment I arrived at the amusement park to see its Disney-style facade and fireworks abloom. Each space within this small, open world is striking and carefully constructed because space is at a premium, where games like Fallout or Skyrim or Ghost Recon create vast tracts of empty, forgettable space between its major set pieces, Nier invests something special in each space it creates and creates a visual signature that you cannot but appreciate. But perhaps the biggest star of the open world is the music, so let's talk about that now. To understand the utterly incomparable magnificence of Nier Automata's soundtrack, you need to understand a few things. Firstly, each song is a delight. There are around 40 of them in total, and not a single one of them is weak. They are beautiful, they are interesting, they are haunting, and they are tonally rich. Where many games can have two or three standout songs, Nier has 40 of them. It completely astounds me that someone can have such an incredibly consistent taste in what makes excellent music. But clearly the game's composer, Keiichi Okabe, is one such person. The second thing to appreciate about Nier's soundtrack is the way that each song has essentially been deconstructed into seven parts, with or without vocals being two of those, and within each of those, there are three layers, quiet, medium, and dynamic. Finally, many songs have been rendered into an 8-bit version to fit the hacking mode minigame you'll often be engaging in when you're playing as 9S. The breadth of the soundscape and its deconstructed layers enables the composer to convey a very specific intent or emotion consistent with the location where that moment is taking place. Take this scene at the amusement park, for example, which is unquestionably one of the strongest and most striking moments in the game. Here at the opening, we hear the basic stems of the amusement track titillating and hinting of the wonder waiting inside. Notice the playful xylophone creating that real theme park sense that's whimsical and familiar. Next, let's up the intensity as we get closer to the center of this strange and mysterious world that we're exploring. Finally, let's hop on a roller coaster and prepare for sensory bombardment as the track is fully unleashed to marry up with the chaos of the gameplay.
absolutely dazzling and it's just one example. There are dozens more of these moments in the game, literally dozens. As I wrote over the space of a week, it became apparent to me that the English language is missing a word to describe the perfect fusion of sound and visuals. A word that succinctly says that yes, this sound belongs with this image. If such a word existed, it would apply to every moment of Nier Automata. Sadly, no such word exists at this time. But as I searched for this word that didn't exist, I was reminded of another word, synesthesia, which is defined as the production of a sense impression relating to one sense or part of the body by stimulation of another sense or part of the body. Looking back on Nier, I realized that this is absolutely the perfect word to describe its effect on you as you play it, as so much of the simultaneous stimulation across all of your senses is guided by the incredible score. Nier's soundtrack is, in my view, the best video game soundtrack in the history of video games. Better than Shadow of the Colossus, better than Journey, better than Hotline Miami, better than Doom or Chrono Trigger or Cross or Persona 4 and yes, even better than Tony Hawk 2. It is simply the most inspired music selection ever to grace a video game and so expertly delivered on a technical level that it beggars belief that this is the first most of us will have heard of this composer. Keiichi Okabe has long been known to fans of Nier and Drakengard but he will now be known to the entire gaming world, and by God, are we the better for it. When I first saw trailers and coverage for Nier Automata, my first reaction was to ignore it because of how gimmicky I thought the gameplay looked. I'm not a fan of hack and slash combat because I typically find it quite dull, and nor am I a fan of bullet hell twin stick shooter gameplay since I find it gets pretty boring pretty fast. I'm also not a fan of games that deviate too far from their core gameplay loops in the name of providing gameplay diversity, since I find that diversity is typically at the cost of that core gameplay loop and it's typically a step down from what we'd expect. So when I saw that Nier had all three of these things, I very quickly determined that Nier was not for me. It was only on the advice of a friend that I gave the game a chance, and I would not have changed my mind on the matter had I not seen for myself how well each of these components actually work, but more importantly how thematically and mechanically linked they are. The core of Nier's combat is a platinum game style hack and slash game. Think Bayonetta meets Devil May Cry and you have the general gist of it. It must be said that the combat feels incredible. It's a little bit awkward at first, but after a small amount of time with the system, it gives way to a feeling of true connectedness with your character. With the shallow button mashing style of play intelligently augmented by a brilliantly implemented dodging system, plus a drone at your side that lays down constant fire between his special abilities like a giant laser cannon. You're going to do a lot of fighting in Nier, and after some 35 hours, I can say that at no point did I tire of charging headlong into a group of enemies ready to cleave them in half. Even now as I say these words, 35 hours behind me, I long to log in again and start fighting. It is absolutely wonderful. While there's plenty of weapons and graceful combos to be had, the true strength of Nier's combat lies in its enemies. There's only around a dozen or so of them in the game, but they evolve throughout the course of your playthrough to gain new abilities, and they are combined in different ways and in different locations to tremendous effect. A lone spearman is easily managed, but 20 spearmen chasing after me means I need to adapt to an entirely different fighting style or I risk being skewered. 10 floating enemies at once is fine, but put a few ground troops into the mix as well and I quickly find myself needing to adapt my combat style yet again. You're always going to be pushing the attack button in this game, no doubt, but your brain will always be engaged because the diversity of enemies and enemy combinations will make every single encounter feel fresh and interesting in ways you could never expect. But this is only the beginning of Nier's gameplay diversity. In addition to a 3D hack and slash mode, the game often pivots to deliver a 2D side-scroller experience, and then suddenly it puts you in a mech and is delivering a 3D bullet hell experience. And then suddenly, you have to hack a machine and it delivers a 2D bullet hell sequence inside of the machine's AI world. There are in essence four gameplay modes in Nier at all times, and Nier is totally unafraid to move between them when you least suspect it 
to awesome effect. And the genius of this diversity is that it's actually not as diverse as it might appear because of the thematic and mechanical congruence I alluded to earlier. The 3D hack and slash gameplay is often peppered with its own bullet hell dodging style play. Through your pod sidekick, you're also constantly firing your weapon, not unlike a bullet hell game. When the camera switches perspective to 2D, your entire moveset from the 3D game is intact making the transition seamless. When you're in your mech during the bullet hell sequences, you're still dodging through attacks as you would in the 3D hack and slash moments. And during the unique hacking sequences, you're still dodging some projectiles and shooting others just as you do in both the hack and slash mode and the bullet hell mode. And the hacking sequence actually makes sense because you're an android and of course you can hack in to the machine world in order to destroy its AI. Where other games awkwardly parachute in random game modes to keep things interesting, the result is typically something cheap and compromised because it isn't properly woven into core gameplay mechanics. In the case of Nier, you get the sense that there is one gameplay system at work the entire time and you're simply able to enjoy it from a variety of perspectives. It's genius because it's at all times flawless, except that maybe there's a bit too much hacking during some of the playthroughs. There's a great deal more to Nier that I haven't discussed yet. There's its subtle and intelligent handling of deep philosophical ideas, its genuinely interesting sense of humor, its remarkably elegant progression and upgrade system, and its hit and miss open world side quest structure. But I feel to cover all of these things in the way they should be covered would push this already very long review into the feature length movie territory of no thank you, I have better things to do. I spoke earlier about synesthesia, which is the phenomenon where one sense stimulates the other sense. Near Automata is game design synesthesia, Every part of the game lends itself to complementing, accentuating, and enlarging the other parts of the game, and it happens in almost every second of its 35-hour duration. The title Game of a Generation is not one that can be given during the generation itself, but can only be given long after that generation has finished. I remember when The Last of Us was released, which was at the tail end of the PS3 life cycle, and many people immediately labelled it the game of the generation because it was certainly a very accomplished experience. But in retrospect, I wonder if other titles such as Mass Effect 2, or the Bungie-led Halo 2 or 3, or of course the seminal Dark Souls, had more of an impact on the trajectory of our medium during that generation. In this way, no one can responsibly say that Nier is the game of the generation, and I'm absolutely not saying that now, but mark my words, Nier will unquestionably be spoken of when those games of the generation lists are compiled. The director, Yoko Taro, is a man with a cult following behind him, but I suspect he will now join the ranks of other named bosses, like Hideo Kojima of Metal Gear fame, Shigeru Miyamoto of Nintendo fame, or Hidetaki Miyazaki of Dark Souls fame. As the influence of Nier ripples across our medium for the next 5 or 10 years, Yoko Taro will be a man that we unquestionably see more of. Easy Allies, the game critics, commented that true authorship is a rare thing in video games, a statement so true in so many contexts, and especially here, where Taro has crafted a marvel of an experience that deserves the status that no one else seems willing to give it. Masterpiece. Yoko Taro, Keiichi Kabe, and the entire Platinum Games team, thank you so much. You have given me an experience I will never forget, and I hope that this review will prompt at least one more person to have that experience as well. Love